All right. Hello, my name is Chris Chan. I'm a hackathon addict. Uh, why do I love hackathons? I love this idea of permissionless innovation. You come up with an idea, get a team together, and in 24 hours try and build something really awesome. And you get to present it in front of judges, and the judges really like an idea. They could turn that into a real product that goes into production. Uh, how many folks have participated in a hackathon before? Okay, some folks here. Uh, so my claim to fame is I've won the most number of hackathons at Yahoo, so uh, I've won about 13 of them, participated in about 15 of them, uh, collaborate with over 95 different hackers uh, over the years, and uh, got some patents out of it, and on average I sleep about 20 minutes at one of these competitions. <laughs> uh, just to frame this, uh, this is a chart of all the different winners uh, over time, and uh, this cluster here is my team, so we're kind of outliers here, I guess. So people look at my career and they think the trajectory looks like this. It's just like, just take off. It was amazing, right? But it actually ends up looking more like this. <laughs> There's a lot of uh, trial and error, crashing and burning, and rising from the ashes pretty much. So, um, so when I was thinking about this talk, I was thinking about how academia prepared me, right? So academia prepares you for this, right? You, you take enough courses and then you, you graduate and that's good, right? But once you get into your career mode, it's kind of less clear what the path of least resistance is. And you are going to fail if you're going to do something interesting. So the story starts in academia. So this was uh, my last class I took. Um, how many of you folks are about to graduate? It's quite a few. OK. And the professor gave us this advice. He said, five years from now, when you come back, your skills should be totally different than what you have today. If you don't have a different set of skills, then you're probably going to be out of date, and you're not going to go very far in your career. And I definitely took that to heart. So fast forward five years into my career, and I started noticing that I was starting to get a little complacent. I was getting too comfortable with my job. I didn't really, uh, wasn't learning as much. And I decided, how do we fix this? And so there are these hackathon contests at our work, and I've always been putting them off. And so I thought, maybe I'm going to try an idea I've had and see what kind of happens, right? So I wandered this hackathon with a small team, and uh, we end up winning two awards, a uh, design award and also Hacker's Choice Award. And that was pretty amazing. We went back the next quarter, and we won. And the quarter again, we won. So it was quite the win streak. We won four in one year. But as time progressed, the next year, uh, I was starting to get a little arrogant with uh, you know, my ideas in hackathons. So I thought I could wander in a hackathon, and any idea I had would just turn to gold. And sadly, that was not true. So I wandered in a hackathon, and we lost for the first time. And it was kind of devastating, because I was linking my identity with winning hackathons. Uh, and I couldn't really recruit anyone on my team once I started losing, because people were thinking, if this guy can't win, why do I bother joining his team? So I call this the year of in the wilderness. It was like a drought. I couldn't win anything. And uh, this picture, uh, I got this horrible beard. I call it my disparity beard. So that was that year. So during that year, uh, one of my pastors actually came up to me and said, uh, he's a mentor as well, and he said, Chris, would you like to speak at a leadership conference? And I thought, why on earth would you want me to speak at a leadership conference? I'm not doing well in my career right now. Nothing's working. And he said, you should do it. Talk about something in that uh, conference. And he also challenged me. He said, in that conference, as long as you help even one person, then that's worth it to do it. So I did it. I gave a talk about where I was in my career, not really winning anything, kind of dealing with this failure. And after the talk was done, a lot of people actually came up and they said, you know, they could totally relate to what I was going through. It was very helpful for them. So that was kind of the inflection point when it started kind of, uh, you know, coming back. So for the comeback, I was trying to think, okay, do I try again or do I just quit and retire? You know, four is pretty good. But I decided, okay, let's, let's do another try again. And before we did that, though, we wanted to make sure that our values and culture was correct, because I didn't want to get big-headed and uh, arrogant again if we made it. So I actually started writing down some of these uh, cultural values for our team. So the first thing was uh, this idea of meritocracy. So uh, this comes from a story I have. Uh, so inside our company, we've got this internal directory of all our titles and names and such. 
And I have this joke where I say I'm a senior summer intern. If you kind of pay attention, you'll realize that's a really long internship to be at a company. And people always ask, well, what happens in winter? And I said, well, they really like me, so I can renew my internship. <laughs> Anyways, so I was uh, trying to raise some funding for a project. And things were going well, and this one executive said, oh, I want to meet with you again to talk about investing this idea. And I said, great. So we sit down, and the mood kind of changes. He basically says, Chris, I don't think you can pull this off because you're just an intern, and this is not going to work. And that was kind of devastating, but it was bizarre to think that someone thought my title was intern, and they're not going to fund it anymore, even though it was definitely not an intern. And so I thought, if I ever kind of made it, I definitely didn't want to have that as a value, right? To keep a meritocracy as a great idea, that should be enough. The second big thing to kind of keeping our team really innovative and uh, you know innovative through the years is also this idea of diversity. So I really love this quote from Malcolm Forbes. He says, diversity is the art of thinking independently together. So I attended this talk, it's by uh, Professor Brian Uzi, and he's got this amazing paper called Atypical Combinations and Scientific Impact. What he did, did was he looked at a bunch of papers to see what were the patterns that made certain papers really innovative and widely cited. And there were two things I kind of got out of it. So one, Typically, the papers that are more innovative and more cited typically involve teams of people. The, the, the ones with one typically are cited less. So what that told me is problems these days are getting more and more complicated. You're going to need a team to kind of work together to create innovative things. The second thing that was very insightful was this idea of atypical combinations. So he saw that these researchers that did innovative work typically were from different disciplines. And when they came together to look at a problem with you know, a different lens, they will come up with very interesting and novel solutions. So I thought in my team, I'm going to need more diverse. I need more people not like me. And what that means, that meant going out meeting other people. It meant traveling around, seeing how people were using technology around the world. It meant having to go to conferences and uh, reading more books about different disciplines that I normally don't know about. Uh, one of the most dreaded things is networking. So I actually don't enjoy this. It's, and. Um, I had to come up with an idea of like how to do this. So this is a life hack I came up with for myself. So I bought a box of business cards, and my goal every year is to get rid of the whole box. And that's a forcing function for me to attend things, to handle business cards, and that's how I'm measuring, am I networking or not? Um, and in fact, it was through networking that I got an opportunity to speak at TEDx, actually. So uh, this kind of works. So if you, want <laughs> if you want business card, come by. I'm giving away them for free. <laughs> so. <laughs> uh, so those were some of the values I wanted to instill in the team to make sure that we were innovative and it was sustainable this time around. So then the spark. So I call this spite-driven development. So at a certain hackathon, I was volunteering and helping different hackers with problems and such. And we had a, a fairly new person come up, and I asked her, uh, what's your team working on? And she said, I didn't have a team. I asked, why not? And she said, oh, my team thinks I'm too new, and I, I'm going to be a drag on the team, so they don't want me a part of the team. And I was kind of outraged about that because, you know, hackathons are about meritocracy. And if you have a great idea, that should be enough. Uh, so I told her, you know what? Let's form a team and beat your teammates. That's spite-driven development. <laughs> <laughs> and because funny is worth points. Uh, so we actually got together and built a hack, and we actually ended up winning. And it was kind of amazing because it was the first time in a year I actually won a hackathon, and the drought finally broke. Uh, so it worked, it was amazing. So later that summer, that's when I was like rebuilding the team now. So I started recruiting actively and I wanted to bring in people who are first time hackers I'd never done it before, bring in some veterans, people from different disciplines. So we had folks who were engineers, product management, engineering, uh, even a lawyer one time, <laughs> and uh, we hacked together. So we had this team of 20 people and we went in and built uh, six hacks in this competition. Guess how many we won? Six, that's way too greedy. We got four, and we actually took a best overall hack as well, and our CEO actually ended up funding one of them, and that was pretty amazing. And the lesson that I learned was, in this one hackathon where we were kind of working together with diversity, uh, 
we accomplished more than my first year put together, right? My first year I won four, and this one hackathon we won four. So that was a pretty amazing results. So now that we're growing up now, then you know, we have to think about what was the purpose of all this, right? And I love this quote from Martin Luther King Jr. He says, life's most persistent and urgent question is, what are you doing for others? So after we got the spotlight because we won so much, I got an email from uh, the CEO's uh, special advisor asking to join their social impact council. And I asked, why on earth would social impact need hackers and such? And they need a way to incorporate you know, our products, engineering, and talent to do social good. Uh, so I accepted and see what I could do to help. So we had a focus on basically uh, encouraging students from underserved communities to get interested in STEM. So we put on things like uh, coding workshops for kids. We go into classrooms to talk to students, to talk about our careers and what you can do with science, engineering, mathematics, and technology. Uh, we do campus tours where we bring kids around to see what our environment was like and kind of show that you know, engineering is pretty cool and tech is kind of cool. And uh, we also help nonprofits. A lot of times they need help with their technology. So whether it's like spruce up a website or help it with some security patches. Like we did that stuff with the team. Another thing that we did to give back was to start mentoring first time hackers. So the people start sending me out to different hackathons around the Bay Area and abroad. And uh, we started encouraging students on how to hack, how to come up with ideas, how to ideate, and that sort of thing. And uh, you never know what's gonna happen when you do this sort of thing. So in this audience was actually my future boss and he was actually watching this talk. And uh, a year later, he actually gives me a call and asks, uh, are you interested in a new opportunity? And uh, I asked him what it was and he just said, well, it's, it's, a, it's a very innovative project and do you know this programming language? I said, no. Do you know anything about mobile apps? I said, nope. And he said, this project has a 20% chance of succeeding, are you in? I'm like, oh, 20%, yeah, well, let's take a gamble and do it. So we actually joined it, it worked out pretty well. I got some of my coworkers here today. Um, but you just never know what will happen, right? So uh, when you give back, you also get some in return as well. Um, one of the highlights of this uh, journey has been uh, this trip to Havana, Cuba. I was just there last week. So I was invited by the World Economic Forum's Global Shapers, and they were doing a workshop, one of the first ever design thinking workshops in Cuba. And we have about 32 Cuban entrepreneurs, and uh, we're training them on how to pitch, how to come with ideas, how to you know, fix needs in their society. And it was an honor going there because it's historical, right, as relations are starting to open with Cuba. And uh, I learned a lot there too. I learned about how their society works, what their technology constraints are, and what kind of products are being built out there. So um, I did promise some of the entrepreneurs that they might end up on the slideshow, so mission accomplished. <laughs> So I'll end with this. So uh, this is a picture from my last hackathon, and I'm always reminded that there were days where I could not get anyone to join me, and now the house is quite full with lots of people helping. And uh, the takeaway here is, as you kind of graduate from university and go on with your career, you're gonna have to learn how to deal with failure and such. And in order to stay innovative, you're gonna have to have the right culture, and that means meritocracy, it means having diversity, and that's how we sustain our wins over the years and such. So um, I wanna thank, these are all the people I've hacked with me over the years, and that's my talk. Thank you very much.